Good evening, esteemed faculty members and all the delegates. Thank you for joining. This is Sahiti on behalf of Shield Connect welcoming you all for today's webinar organized by Safog. And today's topic is colposcopy. So it's my great pleasure to invite the convener of today's webinar, Dr. S. Sampat Kumari Ma. Ma'am is the professor and HOD of Sri Muthu Kumaran Medical College Hospital and RI. Ma'am is past vice president of Foxy and the Senate member of uh, TN Dr. MGR Medical University. And uh, ma'am is the founder secretary of Tamil Nadu Federation of OBGYN. And uh, ma'am is retired deputy director, Institute of OBGYN, MMC Chennai. Ma'am is the president of board of studies, OG, TN Dr. MGR Medical University, chairperson of Foxy Adolescent Health Committee in 2016 to 18 and first ICOG Distinguished GC Member Award in 2021, Chairperson of Women's Wing IMA Chennai South, and Ma'am has received IMA National President's Award and IMA TNSB Award in 2021. I welcome you, Ma'am. Thank you, Sakiti. It's my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Bhagyalakshmi Nayak, Ma'am, who is the other convener of today's webinar. Ma'am is the Professor, Department of Gynec Oncology, AHPGIC, Katak, Past Co-Chair, Oncology Committee, Suffolk, Governing Council Member, ICOG, Chairperson, Oncology Committee, Foxy in 2018-20, and Secretary of AGY. Ma'am is the Peer Reviewer of Indian Journal of Gynecology, Oncology, and other journals. I welcome you, Ma'am. And I hand over the session to Dr. Sampath Kumari, Ma'am. Yes, thank you, Sahiti, for the nice words. Good evening to all, and I welcome you all for this uh, webinar on colposcopy. I thank Dr. Sham Desai sir and uh, Alia Madam and Farana Madam for uh, giving an opportunity to organize this webinar of colposcopy uh, CME. Now we'll start with the uh, prayer songs. Shahiti, can you put that? We'll start with the. Purutam Kalyanam, Arukyam Janasam Pada, Shubham Purutam Kalyanam, Arukyam Janasam Pada, Shatru Buddhi Vinashaya, Chipa Chotil Namusuti, Chipa Chotil Namusuti, Shubham Purutam Kalyanam, Arukyam Janasam Pada. Yes, Sahiti. Can I have the CV of uh, Alia Madam? Alia Madam will introduce Sham Desai. Uh, good evening. Uh, Dr. Alia Madam is uh, the... She is the Professor of Gynae Oncologist and she is the Chairperson of Oncology Committee, CEPOC. And uh, she is doing the fellowships programs, and uh, she is uh, she is working as in the University of Hospital Ka Kanchi, Pakistan. Madam, I was not able to see the words since I had logged in in the cell phone. Welcome, Dr. Alia, Madam. It's uh, can you can introduce our president, Dr. Sham Desai, sir. Thank you. Uh... Dr. Shampat Kumari. Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to all present here, colleagues, guest speakers, and attendees. A special thanks to Professor Shyam Desai, the president of CEFOG, Dr. Farhana Diwan, the secretary general of CEFOG, and our guest of honor, Dr. Nirja Bhatta, uh, for gracing this webinar by your presence. I would like to acknowledge the hard work of Professor Shampat Kumari and Professor Bhagya Lakshmi for putting this webinar together. So I would like to thank all the attendees for joining us today. I hope you will take away some valuable insights as we go through our webinar regarding management of various disorders with colposcopy. Before starting the webinar, I would like to call Professor Shyam Desai for her presidential address. Uh, let me introduce Professor Shyam Desai, who is our chairperson for CEFOG. Uh, he is a um, past president Foxy. Uh, past President Mumbai Ops and Gynae Society, past President Indian Association of Gynae Endoscopist, uh, Vice Chairman ICOG in 2006, President elect of CEFOG from 2023 to 2025, and now he's the 
president, uh, chair, chairman maternal and perinatal health committee, teacher at Mumbai University for 30 years. And she is an honorary professor at Wadia Hospital for 25 years. Uh, and it goes on. So I would request uh, Dr. Shyam Desai for her presidential address. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Professor Aliya Aziz. Uh, you're the chairperson of the South, South, South Asia Federation, OB, OBGYN, the Oncology Committee. And uh, you have been doing a very good job in your tenure. Uh, you have done several webinars and you have uh, encouraged many people to take a further interest in oncology. Now, as we all know that oncology is such an important part of OBGYN, uh, unfortunately, in our curriculums, we do not give enough emphasis for oncology in our undergraduate uh, careers, uh, undergraduate syllabus. And even in the postgraduate syllabus, it is not such an important part that uh, it, it occupies. Now, we all know that there are several ladies who uh, die of, of cancer, especially CS cervix in the South Asian region. And uh, there are so many who are undiagnosed and or they are diagnosed at such a late stage that we cannot do anything uh, significantly to improve their uh, future. Uh, the webinar that you have uh, selected, the topic for the webinar is extremely useful because it is, gives us a further insight into the uh, diagnosis of uh, CA cervix and uh, so besides your visual uh, visual uh, examination your pap smear colposcopy is also a very very important part and it should be included in all postgraduate training programs you have several very eminent people who are going to be uh, talking on the topics given to them and at the end of it i'm sure all of the all of the audience will benefit from this webinar i suggest that I give you all my best wishes and congratulate you for selecting the topic and organizing this webinar. And Dr. Sampath Kumari also has done a great job so in, in uh, organizing it. So all the very best to you and your committees. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the blessing for the webinar, sir. Now, yeah. can I have the CV of Dr. Farana Sakhiti? Yes. Uh, Dr. Farana Madam is the President of OGSB and Secretary General of Setwaga. And she is the Head and Department of the Oncology in uh, IBN Sina Medical College. Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology in different medical colleges. And Deputy National Coordinator FIGO PPH Bundle Project for Bangladesh. Deputy National Coordinator FIGO PPA UCD Project to Bangladesh from 2015 to 2020. Farana Madam, welcome. We need the blessings of you. Thank you, Sampath Madam. I, I welcome everybody to this very important webinar. And uh, I'll begin by thanking Professor Sham Deshai for giving his permission to organize this webinar. And Sari is doing a lot, really, after be, taking charge as the president. And I, I am also trying to do my best. So Dr. Alia Begum, she's a very old friend of us doing so much for this discipline and also for CEFO. Professor uh, Bhagalokhi is also a very old friend of mine and all the organizers and of course our colleagues from Bangladesh and also the colleagues from the region. A very go good afternoon to you all. I think it is. it will be a very exciting, interesting webinar where we will be talking about, there are three sessions as you all will be coming to know. In the first session, we'll be talking about colposcopy. Second one is the pre-malignant disease of vulva and vagina. And third, there will be a, a very exciting and interesting panel discussion because I think that uh, we all know, we, many of us are not oncologists, but we know that we are heading towards the elimination of cervical cancer and WHO has given us a mandate 90-70-90 target, where we are heading towards it. And today, mostly we'll be talking about screening, that is colposcopy. So I think most of us, all of us will be benefited and very helpful. And I request uh, people to be interactive, ask questions if possible. The keynote presenter, the other panelists will be there to answer. Thank you so much for giving me this. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi, are you there? Sahiti Nivja has joined. 
Uh, not yet, ma'am. Ah, uh, ma'am has joined. Yes, just now, ma'am has joined. I can see her. Yes, Bhagya Lakshmi is there. If she is not there, we can introduce the guest of honor, Neerja Madam also. Bhagya Lakshmi is there. Anyway, Dr. Neerja, welcome. Ah, uh, Dr. Neerja is our uh, guest of honor. She is the professor and HOD of AIMS, and at uh, currently she is the vice president of OPSI, and uh, she has done many work in the oncology. And she is the head in Gynec Oncology National Cancer Institute. And uh, first, one minute, first women doctor from India to grace the chairperson of FIGO for Gynec Oncology Committee. And she is the member of advisory groups on issues related to women's cancer and many other things. And uh, developed several biomedical devices to promote the training of the health programs. And she is working to bring low-cost Indian HPV vaccine. Yes. Now, if you think Neeraja, we have to think about the HPV vaccine. She is working much on that. And uh, welcome, Dr. Neeraja. And we are waiting for your blessing. Dr. Neeraja. Thank you very much, Dr. Sampath. I hope you can hear me. Thank yes. you for this kind uh, invitation today and very gracious uh, introduction. And it is indeed a pleasure for me to be here at the CEFOG CME and the President, Dr. Sham Desai, and I see Dr. Farhana from Bangladesh is very active, as well as the dear colleagues, Dr. Alia Begum, and also the wonderful speakers, Dr. Ramani, Dr. Fozia, Dr. Sampath, and Dr. Bhakya to moderate a wonderful panel and all the chairpersons. So it's really, really and truly a pleasure because this is such a topic, as you said, very close to my heart and very important for our South Asia region. And we are so happy that the WHO chose this topic, uh, the Director General, Dr. Tedros, as the theme that for elimination of cervical cancer. And we can see the benefits of that. We can see the spotlight has come. And now even the general gynecologists, we observe that everybody knows that magic letters 90, 70, 90, it has really caught on. So people are aware and wanting to do something. So I see a whole frenzy of activity everywhere. Everybody is ready. And the other best thing is that now technology has evolved so rapidly to keep pace with everything else we have. In colposcopy, now a different world with portable colposcopes, AI will come in. So many things at hand, new technologies for HPV testing. We are just starting a project now to validate the indigenous HPV tests by the international standards. So we are hoping to see affordable HPV testing. So in truth, it is such an era of excitement. And for all of us who have been working for decades in this field, it is a moment of uh, the realization of our efforts. So I'm so happy to see the CME on colposcopy and thank you for inviting me and my congratulations, my best wishes. And uh, really nice to meet all our colleagues of South Asia region, which is contributing the maximum burden to the cervical cancer burden of the world. So it is our responsibility also. If we don't act, the elimination goal will not be achieved. So thank you for organizing this very important topic, Dr. Sampath, and my best wishes to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Neerja, for the nice words. Thank you. So with this inauguration, we will move to the scientific session. Sakiti, can you put the chairperson's CV? I invite Dr. Usma and Dr. He, oh, both of them have joined, no? Dr. Usma? Uh, Dr. Kirtipal has joined, ma'am. Yes. 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 Dr. I think Dr. Uzma is stuck in some emergency. Uh, I came to know because she works in my hospital. So uh, maybe we can start. Uh, no with problem. Kirtipal. I'll introduce Dr. Kirtipal. Sir, Dr. Kirtipal, he is the fellowship in gynec oncology, postgraduation, diploma in reproduction and sexual medicine, assistant professor, National Academy of Medical uh, Science. And currently, senior consultant in uh, Berry Hospital and executive member of Gynecological Society of Nepal, member of Oncology Committee, CEFOG, and AOFOG. 
welcome dr kirti pal you can introduce the speaker dr ramani dev thank you ma'am thank you, thank you so much yes thank you thank you so much ma'am and i want to thank organizer for giving me opportunity to be the part of this uh, uh, seminar so without delay i would like to introduce uh, dr ramani rajendran she is uh, md dgo diploma in and diploma in colposcopy she is member of iscp bscp uj and foxy and she had conducted colposcopy workshops and delivered lectures on spb vaccination colposcopy and related operative procedures in tamil nadu she had written two chapters on uh, cervix uh baskara choudhary's text on clinical gynecology also and she has presented two at international federation of so happy to uh, welcome dr ramani rajendran now the floor is hard thank you kirtipal dr ramani is the qualified uh, colposcopist in uh, south in tamil nadu she is the one who yes. has trained many people in tamil nadu Yes, Ramani, madam. Good evening to all. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good evening to all. Thank you, Safak, and a special thanks to Dr. Sampath Kumari for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I will start with a lecture because I've got a lot of pictures to show. Share screen. Just. Is my presentation uh, visible? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma yes. So the topic that is allocated to me is colposcopy, when and how. And colposcopy is my passion. I've been working, I've been doing only colposcopy for the past uh, 20 years. Teaching, training and practicing. So here in this lecture, we are going to discuss why it should be done, how it should be done, and what is the interpretation. As for the WHO guidelines in 2021 and our Indian um, FOXI guidelines, they have given us two options. One is screen and treat. The other option is screen, triage, and treat. In screen and treat, we just do a primary screening test. If it is positive, you are allowed to proceed and treat the patient according to certain uh, uh, criteria is given for that. Coming to the screen triage and treat, you will have to, based on the positive primary test, it's again followed by a positive second test with or without histopathological diagnosis. So the primary screening test would be via, that is, visual inspection of cervix with acetic acid, a pap smear, or the cytology, and the HPV DNA. Of the three, the WHO's latest recommendation is only HPV DNA test. But till the time the infrastructure is improved to have this as a methodology, we can continue to do with the, continue to proceed um, with the visual inspection and pap smear till the facilities for HPV DNA are available. So when a screen test is positive, like you might have a VIA positive or a cytology that is positive right from atypical squamous cells or atypical glandular cells, L-cell, H-cell, invasive cancer, or a positive HPV, HR, um, high-risk HPV DNA test positive, a suspicious looking cervix. At times we have patients with symptoms like postcoital bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, and persistent vaginal discharge. In all these patients, what next is colposcopy? The main purpose of colposcopy is you will be able to ascertain the lesion, delineate the lesion, and treat so that your treatment would be precise, accurate, and it thereby avoids over-treatment. So all of you are aware that colposcoping is nothing but a binocular stereoscopic microscope. 
this is a microscope that is mounted on a stand, whereas our um, usual pathological microscopes are on the, it's a table model. Here it is um, mounted on a mobile stand. And you have a number of varieties, as Neerja said, now they are coming up with handheld ones. These are the manual ones. And this is the digital ones. All this is you have to do. You have, whereas here with the press of a button, everything is a, is a, a, done and it is recorded. So coming to colposcopic procedure as such, one first thing you have to do is the 4C is you have to counsel the patient, ally all of yours, get an informed consent. May, so only with this, the patient becomes more comfortable, relaxed, and you have to use the correct, size speculum um, according to her parity and proceed. The first step is you have like army, we also have a line of control or line area of control that begins from the mons pubis up to the anus. So when a, a patient comes with a postmenopausal bleeding, straight away a speculum is in, uh, introduced, you might miss an urethral currently. Or patient complains of um, uh, uh, some irritation in the um, in the foreshed. Only if you examine this area, you will be able to see. Otherwise, it is where the handle of the speculum will fall. So you, that area gets totally obscured when you do. And second is the, uh, the anal warts. So that also has to be looked in. Most of the time, it is mistaken for a sentinel pile mass. So coming, uh, we uh, as such are following only the International Federation of Cervical Pathology and Pulposcopy Nomenclature of 2011. So the first thing that we uh, do is the general assessment, wherein we need to um, specify if the cervix is adequate or inadequate for visualization. And we have to Describe the new squamous columnar junction and we have to describe the transformation zone as well. So a cervix is considered adequate when the cervix, when you put in a speculum, it should look at you. In most of the two or three previous cesarean, cervix gets stuck behind the symphysis pubis. It is felt, but it is not seen. So this is an adequate cervix. The cervix must look at you. The entire, the transfer, the new squamous columnar junction, the transformation zone must be visible. So if the examination is considered inadequate, when the entire uh, transformation zone is obscured by, see, this is a previous surgery. The cervix is stuck to one side. You are not able to see it. A previous for the gill surgery, entire topography is altered. Can you guess what it is? Any guess? This is a case of transverse vaginal septum, totally cutting off the view of the cervix. Menopause 20 years, the cervix is small, atrophic like a button, hitched high up. When the cervix is obscured by slough, by blood, by pus. Coming to the step, uh, second step is you may have a mention about the discharge that you're seeing. You can have a milky discharge, cheesy discharge, curdy discharge, a frothy discharge, which is invariably indicative of infections and a mucus discharge. In the third step, we switch on the green filter so that the blood vessels gets highlighted. So the green filter the, uh, removes the background redness, thereby it helps to identify the blood vessels more use, easily. And we have a multimodality you know, green filters now in the latest equipments as grade one, two, and three. So this is the normal blood vessel pattern, thin tapering um, ones. So this is, so there are three different types. The first pattern is the tree branching one, long regular branching blood vessels. Can you make out the difference when you switch on the green filter? And the second is the ones that we see over the nebothian follicles and the cyst, where you have a regular structure branching of blood vessels and it 
it is um, joined to form a network. And the third pattern that is seen is on the cervix that has undergone treatment, you have long, lengthy, parallel blood vessels. So this is the fine capillary network that will be appreciated as you keep on doing colposcopy. So on the left side, we have the normal blood vessel pattern. On the right side, we have the blood vessels which have got abnormal shape and size. So atypical blood vessels are those which have got an abrupt interrupt course. So once you have said whether it is adequate, you have noted the discharge, you have switched on the green filter, and then we need to trace the squamocolumnar junction. So if when the squamocolumnar junction is completely visible like this, see the, in the junction between the pale pink and the red area is the squamocolumnar, new squamocolumnar junction. Likewise, it's completely visible. So here, on the anterior lip, it's visible. On the posterior lip, it's not visible. So we label this as squamocolumnar junction seen partly. In, in such cervix, previous cesarean, postmenopausal, you it is totally not visible, completely drawn into the uh, endocervical canal. The next thing is we have to determine the type of TZ. That is the transformation zone. So we have to map the transformation zone. Here is a cervix which is studded with Nabothian follicles all over. So here you take the Nabothian follicle cyst or cryptopening that is the most further away and draw an imaginary circle all around. So that forms the boundary of the old squamous columnar junction. The junction between the pale pink and the red area is the new squamous columnar junction. So the area in between the both the old and the new squamous columnar junction is the transformation zone. This is yet another example where the old and new squamous columnar junctions is mapped. So the most important landmark in the cervix for a colposcopist is the transformation zone. It is at this zone, most almost 99.9% .9 of the CIN and invasive cancers arise from. So what is the difference between the new squamous columnar junction and the... See, the new squamous columnar junction forms the inner boundary of the transformation zone. So the landmark to um, um, mark the old squamous columnar junction could be the most further away Nebothian follicle, Nebothian cyst or a cryptopening. So coming to the types of um, TEZ, you have type 1 where the, it is entirely ectocervical and it is fully visible. It can be small or large. See, here is a cervix where you are able to make out a solitary Nebothian follicle. So that is taken as the landmark for the old squamous columnar junction. The junction between the pale pink and the red area is the new squamous columnar junction. So in between the two is the transformation zone. This is the type 1 transformation zone fully visible. Coming to the type 2, this has got an endocervical component, but that is fully visible. It can have an ectocervical component, which could be small or large. See here, when you use a, an endocervical speculum, you are able to make out the margin, uh, the new squamous columnar junction. Right? Are you able to appreciate? So this is a uh, cervix, where the cervix is, has an asymmetrical tear of the os. And I have elevated the anterior lip using a, a, a sponge stick. So this is the old squamous columnar junction. This is the most further away uh, Nebothian um, crypt opening. So that is the old. This is the new. In between is the transformation zone. So it has got an endocervical component, but that is fully visible. 
So in type 3 transformation zone has an endocervical component that is not fully visible. It can also have an ectocervical component which can be small or large. See, for example, this is the Nebothian follicle. So this is the old squamous columnar junction. The new squamous columnar junction is hidden inside the endocervical um, okay, endocervix. So this is a type 3 transformation zone. So now you apply... 5% acetic acid and Lugol's iodine and you start interpreting the findings. So the normal colposcopic findings, depending upon the reproduct, uh, upon the age, in the reproductive age, in the menopausal age, during pregnancy, how the cervix looks. So coming to the uh, original squamous epithelium, it is pale when you add acetic acid, and it is pale, pink, featureless, does not stain white, and unless you have a patch. It's a normal cervix, there is no patch. So it is pale, pink, featureless. You call it mature when the superficial layers are producing glycogen. That combines with the Lugol cyanide and produces the rich mahogany brown color. At the perimenopause period and the menopause, postmenopause, there is no estrogen, there is no uh, superficial layers, no intermediate layers, only parabasal and basal. So the substance of the cervix is very much reduced. The cervix is flushed with the vault. And because there are no superficial layers, no source of glycogen, so it uniformly stains um, as yellow color. Mustard yellow in color. So that is unlike the um, the um, reproductive age group, it is uniformly mustard yellow. Because it has only the parabasal and basal layer, all these immediately they start having petechial points, which should not be taken as as um, bleeding on touch. It is a, a typical feature of postmenopausal ladies. And ideally in postmenopausal ladies, Pap smear should not be combined with colposcopy on the same day. You have to give adequate time and only then your interpretation would be right. Coming to the columnar cells, these columnar cells oh, sorry, are grape-like villi and each villi has got a vascular core that gives it the reddish color. So previously such cervix were described as erosion. But now we know it is the presence of columnar cells on the ectocervix that is described as an ectopy. So this is an ectop a large ectopy on the cervix, which this doesn't produce glycogen. Columnar cells do not produce glycogen, so they remain unstained pink in color. Whereas, see, this is a cervix where there is no ectopy, right? The difference between ectropion and ectopy. Here, the, you can you make out the os is circular, whereas here it is stone cervix, right? As a result, the lower part of the endocervical canal is exposed or everted, and that is the difference between an ectopy and an ectropion. So this is a large ectopy on the cervix. Green filter, no abnormal blood vessels. When you add acetic acid, what happens is these small villi, because of the acidic pH, they imbibe water and they all become swollen and the vascular, central vascular core gets constricted and it appears pale. So this is the time most of the VAAs are reported as false positive. And they, even in colposcopy for a beginner, this will appear like a lesion. So we need to wait for some time. So at this point of time, we have to rule out lesions beyond an ectopy. So we see at 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and 6 o'clock. So as you give time, slowly the columnar cells, they regain their color. And then you add iodine. So this, you have only two colors on the cervix, brown and pink. So why you should look beyond an ectopy? Because the lesions are beyond the ectopy, beyond the ectopy. See, can you make out a faint acetyl white patch at 12 o'clock? 
right? Whenever you see three colors on the cervix, pale pink, the squamous epithelium, the columnar red, and the faint acetovite. So this is again a, a large ectopy. I'm looking beyond the ectopy. I'm able to make out a lesion in the anterior lip between 12 to almost 3 o'clock. Posterior lip, a dense lesion between 4 and 5, which would have otherwise been missed. Coming to the metaplastic epithelium, see the once the columnar cells are out on the ectocervix, a large ectopy, the body understands, the defense mechanism understands that this vantage point of entry of, for infection is being covered by single layer columnar cells. As a result, what happens, mainly because of the acidic vaginal pH, this single layer columnar cells get sloughed up and the cuboidal reserve cells start producing um, the metaplastic cells, which comes from the periphery towards the center. So the features of metaplastic epithelium are nebothian follicle, nebothian um, crypt openings, and tongues of metaplasia. So this is a sieve-like membrane that comes from the periphery towards the center. So those areas that are pale pink, resembling the uh, stratified squamous epithelium, will now take up iodine when you add um, the Lugol's iodine. So this one of this part which takes up nice rich brown color is labeled as mature metaplasia and all these areas are immature metaplasia. For a beginner, one has to take biopsies to confirm it is immature metaplasia. So this is again a cervix that looks congested to the eye. Green filter, no abnormal blood vessels. And when you add acetic acid, you find this change. You are able to make out the old squamous columnar junction, the new squamous columnar junction. And when you add iodine, you describe the cervix as cervix, mature, squamous epithelium, adequate for visualization, new SCG seen completely, type 1 TZ, squamous epithelium mature, columnar epithelium, small ectopy on the anterior lip, Metaplastic epithelium, both mature and immature metapla um, metaplasia present. No lesions on the TZ. So this is the my pregnant uterus. This is how deciduous of pregnant um, the cervix looks. Because of the increased vascularity, fluid retention, it bleeds on touch because of increased fragility. So the documentation is the most important part of it. So you can for, uh, format your own... Um, uh, documentation like this along with the pictures and give it to the patient. So to report normal, sometimes it's very, very difficult. That needs practice. Coming to the abnormal colposcopy, here more attention is paid to the um, location and size of the lesions. They are graded into grade one or um, the minor lesions, major or grade two, non-specific lesions, and suspicious of invasion and miscellaneous findings. So coming to the location, so whether it is located within the transformation zone or outside, this is the crypt opening that is seen further away. So that is the old squamous columnar junction. This is the new squamous columnar junction. Entire lesion is within the squamous um, transformation zone. That is indicative of a high-grade lesion. You have flat condylomas, right, extending over the cervix, anterior phonix. And so this is both inside and outside the transformation zone. So according to the clock position, here there is a lesion that extends between 12 to 3 o'clock. Size of the lesion is again an indicator of histological grade. That can be uh, the cervix is visualized as a the four quadrant structure. So we here you have a lesion that is more than one and a half quadrants, or as a percentage. Size of the lesion is a percentage of the cervix, except for a small part here at nine o'clock. It is a almost ninety eight percent of the cervix is covered by a acetovite lesion. So grade one lesions are those with a thin acetovite epithelium, irregular geographical borders, fine mosaic and fine punctations. Can you make out the faint acetovite, thin acetovite lesions? 
they have got irregular borders. It resembles that of a bat. And fine punctations refers to terminal capillaries surrounding blocks of abnormal epithelium going around. So these are fine um, mosaic pattern. This is yet another example of fine mosaic. Punctations refers to dilated capillaries, head-on view of dilated capillaries that terminate on the surface. They are seen as dots. So you take a white paper and prick it with a pin. This is fine punctations. This is how it looks. So coming to major or grade two, you spray acetic acid. By the time you turn to take a swab, you have a rapid appearance of aceto whiteness. It's very intense aceto white. It's got a raised sharp borders, coarse mosaic pattern, got coarse punctations. Indirectly, it gives you an idea of the caliber of the blood vessels that's feeding this area. And you have cuffed or rimmed glands. So these are the crypt openings. So when the entire wall of this crypt gets infiltrated with abnormal cells, they, sorry, they appear as cuffed glands or rimmed glands. The next two signs are very important, are always indicative of high grade lesion. One is the inner border sign. Here you have a circumferential lesion. Of within that, you have a, a dense aceto white area, a lesion within a lesion. Here again, there is a cervix replaced by a growth. But see here, this is more dense than the others. So there is an inner border sign. Likewise, in the anterior lip, there is a lesion of which this area is more dense than the other. So this is defined as an inner border sign. Coming to the ridge sign, this is as if something is stuck on the cervix, something protruding, projecting. That is the ridge sign. Coming to non-specific um, uh, colposcopic findings, the first is the leukoplakia. It's also known as keratosis. Leukoplakia is, I describe this as the icing on the cervix. You put in a speculum, you see a white patch even before the addition of acetic acid. Leukoplakia is essentially benign, but it can cap a malignant area. So whenever you see a leukoplakic patch, you need to biopsy it. So this patient also, we have done a biopsy that is confirmed as a infiltrating squamous cell carcinoma. Erosion is now totally um, and, um, uh, is being used to denote an area of denuded epithelium. It's usually caused by trauma it is an indication of an abnormal surface epithelium. Coming to the iodine staining, see here you, with acetic acid, you are not able to make out a lesion. But with iodine, it is patchy. Here again, there is a nebothian follicle. This nebothian follicle has not taken up iodine. Here you have a big nebothian follicle obstructing the external os. This is beautifully mahogany stained, brown color. This is again a cervix with profuse discharge. When you clear the discharge at acetic acid, you are not able to make out any lesion. Whereas with iodine, it is a entirely a different picture. That is why, because of its um, erratic staining, it has lost its significance for screening. Only now the screening is with visual inspection of cervix with acetic acid, 5%. We no longer use iodine and iodine is mainly used in colposcopy. Coming to the, when do you suspect um, invasion? So when you have atypical blood vessels, atypical blood vessels are a hallmark of invasive cervical cancer. They appear and disappear suddenly. They are like uh, truncated branches of a tree that no branches or uneven caliber. They are known as polarod trees, atypical blood vessels, bizarre shape and size. 
Coming to the additional uh, signs, you can have fragile blood vessels. Just introduction of a um, um, uh, speculum, it starts bleeding because of stretching. Irregular surface, mountain and valleys. Necrotic, with foul smelling discharge. This is the typical uh, cauliflower like growth, exophytic lesions. Cervix replaced by a gross neoplasm. This is also described as the rag sign, where the, the surface epithelium gets peeled off and hangs like a rag, right? Coming to the miscellaneous um, the findings, you might have a congenital transformation zone where you have the entire cervix that is acetobite with an extension going on to the anterior and posterior. Biopsy would confirm it. Coming to the warts, these are vulval warts, vaginal warts, cervical warts, anal warts. So this is a picture of a patient with anal wart. Speculum examination, we could see pyometra. Then when cervix is visualized, abnormal atypical blood vessels with typical rimmed glands, it was an invasive cancer. Ectocervical polyps, endocervical polyps. In this case, this was a nursing tutor with the complaints of profuse discharge, watery discharge. So this, if you take this as the outer boundary, this is the old squamocolumnar junction. This is the new squamocolumnar junction, no lesions on the ectocervix. But then I could see a polyp which had leukoplakia. So when we biopsy it, it was adenocarcinoma of the uterus. So whenever you have a leukoplakia, the lesson is always you need to take a biopsy. Coming to inflammation, so can you make out the frothy discharge? So strawberry red spots. So they appear as leopard skin spots with this is the cervix with fine mottling described as stars filled night sky. This is the typical leopard skin spots of trichomonas vaginalis. This fine mottling, extensive fine mottling could be a there would be an <clears throat> indication of diabetes and undetected diabetes. Number of diabetics can be di diagnosed in the colposcopy clinics. So this is stenosis, para 4. See, you are not able to make out the external loss. So this is the stenosis. So this patient was referred as an abnormal looking cervix. So when I put in a speculum, I could see something jetting out like a sunshade from the cervix. So when I looked, uh, there was no lesions on the cervix. And um, then I asked her, whether she has had any surgeries immediately after bending, she confirmed that she had a septum removal. So post cryo, this is how the cervix looks. Or post legs. That is why it has been said that we need to see these patients only after one year. Otherwise, it will give you a lot of false positive ones. So how many of you all can see a young lady the profile of a young lady. How many of you all can see an old lady with a big nose? Right? So I might say it is a high-grade lesion. Some part might say it's a low-grade lesion. So we need to have some universal method of, um, of um, detecting, identifying lesions. So we follow the sweet score. In sweet score, we take five parameters. The acetobite uptake, the margins, the vessels, the elision size, and iodine staining. Each one is given a, stain, um, a score of 0, 1, and 2. Maximum score is 10. Even in that shade, acetobite uptake is of three shades. Can you make out this faint or zero transparent acetobite? This is the shady milky white. That's given a score of 1. This is a distinct opaque white. 
So here is a cervix which looks normal to the naked eye, congested. But then when you add acetic acid, you are able to make what a faint aceto white patch, shady milky white, sharp borders. And each one, it's given a score. It's a small lesion. So less than 5 mm, so 0. And totally iodine negative. So it has got a total score of 4. When you have a score less than 5, it does not require a biopsy because of the low risk of cervical cancer. But such patients have to be followed up within every six months. So coming to the next case, here is a congested cervix, no blood vessels, absent blood vessels. So it's given a score of one. When adding acetic acid, you find a shady milky white patches with sharp borders on up here and here. So, we it's a large patch. So, we have given it a maximum score of 2, more than 15 mm, distinctly yellow 2. So, the total score is 7 out of 10. And you need to do multiple biopsies and then treat according to the findings. So, coming to the third case, the cervix looks congested, more congestion on the posterior lip. And green filter, no abnormal blood vessels. But we I add acetic acid, you have a dense aceto white lesions with sharp borders. Can you make out these sharp borders? Coarse punctations, coarse mosaic pattern, cuffed glands, distinctly yellow in color. So here you have. See here, what happens is though the lesion is a little small, but you have an endocervical extension and hence it's got a maximum score of 10. When you have a score of more than 8, you need to do an excisional biopsy. So come, all these lesions are only for the squamous component of the cervix. For the glandular component, there are not much um, descriptive pictures or uh, lesions. Um, on a pap smear, whenever you come across atypical gland vessels, favors neoplasia, you have to triage with ideally with a HPV um, HR DNA testing, which would come out at 16 or 18 positive. Pulposcopy, and there was no lesions on the ectocervix. So the next option is only a large loop excision, LEDs or a leap. Both are, are both the same. Right? It's like a right hand and a left hand drive car. So, sorry. It's not working. So, whenever you have an atypical gland results, ideally at the first colposcopic well, visit, you are advised to do a LEDs and only with the histopathology you would be able to treat such a case. And you need to fulgrate the base So coming to this case, a 46-year-old lady on speculum examination has got leukoplakic patches all around, green filter, abnormal blood vessel seen, acetic acid, you have dense acetovite changes all over, and totally iodine negative. So these forms, the colposcopic reports, reporting format is available in the IARC, that is International Agency for Research on Cancer websites. You can download them and um, use this. So as per this, um, you will also have to do a sweet scoring. And uh, coming to the sweet score, this is again all 10 out of 10. 
they have done the LEDs and they have come out with a histopathology report as well. Presence of leukoplakia in the transformation zone is always um, suspicious of high grade lesions or even invasive cancer. So, is this a normal cervix? Speculum examination, innocent looking cervix. No abnormal blood vessels. On acetic acid, you find a large circumferential lesion. So, all that glitters is not gold. All the cervix that looks innocent and healthy or not so. This is again a cervix replaced by a growth that bleeds on touch. And multiple biopsies have been done. It confirmed to be tuberculosis on non-pulmonary tuberculosis on starting treatment within eight weeks, the cervix healed beautifully. So the lesson is all growths are not carcinomas as well. So a cervix to be labeled as normal needs to be certified. And uh, as uh, already mentioned, the WHO has come out with the initiative, the cancer cervix elimination. And so it has um, devised a formula of 90-70-90, thereby to reduce the incidence of cancer by 2030. We have got only six more years to bring it down to a single digit of four per 100,000 population. For this, they have said 90% of the girls have to be fully vaccinated before the age of 15. 70% of women should be screened at least twice in the lifetime, 35 and 45. And 90% of women detected with pre-cancer should be treated. 90% of Patients with invasive cancer should be managed at the um, cancer institutes. So the easy way to remember this 90-70-90 is GST, right? So this is again to emphasize on the 90s. Here the government of India has now brought out the vaccination for school children. And um, very soon, Tamil Nadu will be introducing HPV DNA testing as a primary modality of screening. And all the PHCs are equipped with thermal ablation. So all pre-cancer lesions that are detected would be treated and our women would be very soon free of cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ampar. Thank you once again. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam. Fantastic. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it was a very wonderful, wonderful uh, lecture given by ma'am. Uh, really, it was so impressive. And I thought I had been doing uh, colposcopy since a lot time, long time, but I realized today that I have been doing nothing and I have to learn a lot and lot and lot. So, uh, and the main thing the ma'am uh, told at the last was all that glitters are not gold. So, we should be suspicious on every cases. Now, uh, thank you, ma'am, very much for your insightful lecture, your expertise, uh, and mainly presenting style made it very engaging and informative. Well, full time, we were, we were just listening to you and, and looking at your pictures, and they were so insightful. Uh, they are truly invaluable and truly valuable and your expertise is truly appreciated. Ma'am, thank you so much for the class and I would, from my personal part, I would like to meet you very soon, ma'am. Thank you so much. It was very wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ramani, madam, for the wonderful talk. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Any doubts? Madam, if there is any doubt in the chat box, please answer, Ramani, madam. Yes. If that is doubt. Next, we will go to the next session. Thank you. Sahiti. Thank you, Kritala, sir, for sharing the session. We will go to the next topic. Dr. Bhagi Lakshmi, are you there? Yes, yes, madam. There is some issue with my laptop, actually. I am there throughout. Okay. So, I can introduce the second speaker, the chairperson. I think Dr. Namka and Dr. Shahana is there. 
No, Madam Dr. Namka will not be able to join. He has some issue. So in yes. his place, Dr. Ogen will be joining and she has joined. Thank you, Dr. Ogen, for having joined with short notice. Yes, Dr. Dr. Ogen is a co-founder and board member of Water Cancer Society. She is MBBS from Government Medical College, Amritsar. And she is a postgraduate in obstetrics and gynecology from Bologna University, Italy. But then all said and done, she has been the one person the heart and soul of cervical cancer prevention in Bhutan and I think uh, has uh, done uh, colposcopy in most of the areas she has covered in the hilly areas everywhere. So I think uh, she really is a very, very hardworking person. So thank you, Dr. Ogen, for joining. We will request you to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Fuzia. Dr. Shana, are you there? Yeah, Dr. Shana also told that there will be some issue. She may not join. But anyway, Dr. Shana is a professor in the Department of Gynae Oncology at the National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital, Dhaka, Bangladesh. So over to you, Dr. Uh, uh, Ugin. Dr. Ugin, please uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi for, for your introduction. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Fazia Hossein. Uh, she's RCOG IRC Chair Bangladesh 2024, Vice President of BD SCCP, Chairperson Person of Research Development Committee, and pub Publication Secretary of Fertility Preservation Society and Bangladesh Menopausal Society, and Chairperson and Gender Based Person of Gender Based Violence Committee, Member Secretary of Gynae Oncology, Honorary Secretary of IRC RCOG. So he published 36 articles and contributed to books in OPS and Gynae, Clinical Lead of Protocol and Guideline of RCOG an invited speaker in more than 30 international and national conferences and on editor editorial board of international and national journals. So got Young Gynecologist Award in 2003 and UGC Gold Medal for Research in 2011 and Mother Teresa Award in 2015. So please, I welcome Dr. Fazia to start her uh, topic. Thank you, madam. Uh, it is an honor and pleasure for me to speak in this August gathering. I would like to thank the uh, SEPO Oncology Committee. So I bring warm greetings from Bangladesh as we emerge into the 53rd uh, year of independence of Bangladesh. So assalamu alaikum and a very good evening yeah. to the ladies and gentlemen of this August gathering. Sorry. Can you see Mira. my presentation? Huh? Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, it's seen. So please make it slide Is it visible? Yes, yes, yes. Dr. Fazia. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, today we shall be uh discussing about the understanding and management of the vulval and vaginal intraepithelial lesions. Unlike the previous uh, honorable presenter, Madam uh, Romani, she mentioned about the colposcopy, which is quite well known to the clinicians. But vulva and vaginal female lesions is quite uncommon uh, because women come to us, present to us in a very late stage. So before I start, I would like to mention about the reflect about the unspoken story of Mrs. Staraman Bibi, aged 38 years, was she was pregnant with her second child, and she developed some symptoms of redness, toughening in the vulval skin with persistent itching. She did not consult her doctor, and she did not even mentioned about it. And there was delay in diagnosis of vulval cancer. And when it was diagnosed, it was already stage four, and complication of radiotherapy resulted in fistula. I should come to the other half of this slide at the end of my presentation. So if you come to the background of vulval epithelial neoplasia, we know that the vulvar skin is a component of the allogenital epithelium 
and uh, it has a common uh, cryogenic origin. Neoplasia of the vulvar skin is associated with multiple foci of dysplasia, and uh, this anogenital epithelium extends from the distal vagina to the perineal and the perianal skin. And vulvar interepithelial neoplasia is uh, associated with sexually transmitted infections, especially with HPV and HIV. Now, the incidence and prevalence varies depending upon the geographical location and the access to healthcare also depends upon the screening practices. It is actually very less common compared to the survival and epithelial neoplasia, and the occurrence is increasing due to the change in the sexual behavior of the women, and occurs in the premenopausal and postmenopausal women, and the median age is 40 years. Um, the average age is shifting to go towards a younger women with 75% of lesions occurring during the premenopausal period. So there is no racial predisposition to VIL. Now, what are the risk factors? Are the persistent infection of HPV 16 and 18, tobacco smoking, immunosuppression with HIV AIDS, or those who are undergoing immunosuppressive therapy, lichen sclerosis, chronic vulvovaginal infections, um, Early age at first, sexual intercourse, multiple sexual partners, and history of STIs are risk factors. Now, we know that we, there was an older classification of vulvar interpithelial neoplasia, where it was VIN 1, 2, and 3, and uh, the usual type of VIN, and then came the differentiated type of VIN. Now, it typically affects the older women and may be associated with lichen sclerosis. The term VIN is not no longer used, and the VIN 2 and 3 are simply called VIN. There is no evidence that VIN 1 to 3 reflects any biologic continuum, or VIN 1 is a cancer precursor. So the terminology has changed. So this is the usual VIN versus the differentiated VIN. In the usual VIN, the host factors are that the younger women are affected with uh, HPV infection, and they are usually they, uh, they have smoking. And the invasive carcinoma which uh, develops are from the warty and the basilar type. And the differentiated VIN, it is not associated with HPV infection. The lichens, they are associated with lichen sclerosis and lichen thinus. Uh, older women are mainly affected, and the invasive carcinoma is usually the keratinized type. The International Society for the Study of Vulvar Vaginal Disease in 2004 had the classification in three main broad headings. One was the non neoplastic epithelial disorder of vulva, including the lichen sclerosis, comus and hypothasia, and other dermatosis. Number two was the intraepithelial neoplasia, and then the invasive disease of vulva cancer. When the classification of squamous because the lesion in 2015 was ENSIL, HSIL, hybrid squamous intraepithelial lesion of vulva, and the differentiated type of VI. Now, the introduction of LAST, or the lower anogenitus squamous terminology in 2012, raised two concerns. There was a lack of reference to the differentiated VIN. The potential to overtreat the low-grade squamous epithelial lesion was actually seen. And again, there was that uh, the basaloid or water VIN occurred in young women, uh, those who were smoking and those who had history of HPV infection. And the differentiated type occurred in elderly women and with the incidence of lichen sclerosis, squamous hypoplasia, adjacent to the tumor, and those were unrelated to HPV infection or smoking. And the differentiated type of vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia had higher rates of malignant progression than the usual VIN. The importance of screening and early detection. We can prevent the uh, vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia with the HPV vaccination because we all know that human papilloma virus can cause the intraepithelial neoplasia of the vulva, vagina, anal, perianal vision, and the cervix. So we can, uh, it can be um, focused, smoking cessation, practicing safe sex, and maintaining good hygiene. And the other effective strategies are to maintain the guidelines and follow the treatment protocols. And the screening for vulva and vaginal precancerous lesions involve visual inspection during pelvic examination, colposcopy, pap smear, and we have to take biopsy of suspicious lesions. So this is the vulva, and the vulva intraepithelial neoplasia can occur anywhere in the pulse pubis, the labia majora minora, and anywhere in the vestibule. Now, what are the signs and symptoms? There might be visible lesions, or like red pigmented patches or plates, 
they may complain of pruritus, uh, dysuria, dyspareunia, and bleeding, which may be unrelated to menstruation. And the um, history of immunosuppression, smoking, uh, lacking sclerosis, normal hypoplasia, HPV infection uh, may be present. And on physical examination, we might find white or hyperkeratotic gray pink lesions in the form of plaques or nodules or ulcerations. These are some examples of hypertrophic lichen planus, erosive lichen planus, and vulvar psoriasis. And uh, some other features of lichen implication. This is VIM3 or carcinoma C2, previously known as Vals disease and vulvar cancer. What are the clinical examination findings we've already mentioned? And if there are uh, any lesions, we have to do a colposcopy, which provides magnified visualization of the vulvar lesion. And abnormal vascular patterns associated with a severe degree of VIN, carcinoma in situ, or early invasive disease. And we have to take biopsy from this suspicious lesion and send it for histopathological confirmation to find out the degree of dysplasia. But what are the diagnostic techniques? Apart from the colposcopy, there is HPV testing, which may be performed alone or in conjunction with pap smear. And pap smear, normally we know that we do uh, we uh, can screen for the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, but cells from the cervix, from the vagina and vulva for cytological examination can be taken to detect abnormal cells, abnormal cells on the vulva surfaces. We can also do via ambuli, applying acetic acid or liquid iodine solution to the vulva or vagina highlight abnormal areas, which can then be examined visually for suspicious lesions. Now we have to take biopsy to confirm our diagnosis. We can take a poly biopsy or an excisional biopsy, and these should be sent for histological assessment and the features will include cellular atypia, dysplasia, and other architectural abnormalities. Now, how to take a biopsy from a vulvar lesion? We have to take a, a liberal biopsy, including the underlying stroma, but to avoid the necrotic center of the tumor. And all lesions should be biopsied separately in women with multiple vulvar lesions, and those should be clearly documented by mapping. Colposcopy, I've already mentioned. The high resolution endoscopy designed for examining the inner canal and the perianal area. The high resolution endoscopy can aid in the detection of anal intrapithelial neoplasia in high risk population. Other imaging studies include ultrasound or MRI, then to see the extent or, uh, of disease. And if there, we are suspecting uh, distant spread of cancer, the CT can be done. What are the treatments of VI? It should be individualized. And it is aids to control symptoms and prevention uh, so that it is not progressed to the invasive cancer. So for a localized hybrid VI lesion, we have to take a wide local excision and with a disease-free margin of at least 15 millimeter. Excision has the advantage of excluding the invasion histologically. A uh, superficial valvectomy with a split thickness skin graft can be done in case of large confluent lesion or an extensive multifocal disease. The skinning valvectomy has an advantage if it provides both treatment and diagnostic specimen. Carbon dioxide laser surgery and immune response modulator in young patients if the disease is extensive in the hair-bearing areas or in the periclitoral, periurectoral, or perianal region uh, carbon dioxide laser surgery can be done, and sometimes imiquimod immune response modifier can be used. So the vulvar chromosome carcinoma constitutes about 90% of vulvar malignancies, and it arises from the precursor lesion, vulvar epithelial neoplasia. The uh, and around one third of this is caused by human papilloma virus. The majority of VSCC are HPV independent and arise on the background of chronic dermatosis. The somatic mutations of TP53 have been implicated in the pathogenesis of this category, and the precursor solution is called differentiated VIN. It was published in 2020 in the Critical Reviews in Oncology. Um, and in the same uh, year, 2020, it mentioned that the histology and immunohistochemistry have been the basis of diagnosis and classification of VIN. In recent years, uh, the prognostic biomarkers are also done, but for VIN and VSCC, molecular characterization has been attempted in a limited number of studies so far, in the, as I have seen in the 2020 publication of Critical Reviews in Oncology. 
Next, another pain malignant lesion is Paget's disease. It was originally Paget's disease was a breast lesion, and it affects women over 60 years of age, and vulva accounts for 60% of cases. The classification of Paget's disease are primarily two in number, primary Paget's disease and secondary Paget's disease of the vulva. Primary Paget's disease, intrapithelial Paget's disease, IPD with stromal invasion, as a manifestation of underlying adenocarcinoma of skin appendage or subcutaneous vulvar gland, and secondary Paget's disease is secondary to anorectal adenocarcinoma, um, secondary to urothelial carcinoma as a manifestation of non-cutaneous adenocarcinoma like endocervical, endometrial, and ovarian. You might say that why uh, I'm not following the 2015 classification, it doesn't mention about Paget's disease. But still, when we find these lesions, we have to uh, make the diagnosis and come to the treatment plan. As I mentioned, it is uh, eczematoid in appearance, begin in the hair wearing portions. Treatment is by surgical excision uh, with margins of one centimeter. We have to confirm the diagnosis by that. We can go for radiotherapy, photodynamic therapy, laser therapy. Sometimes topical imiquimodipine can be used. Other non neoplastic epithelial disorders I'm going to briefly go through are lichen sclerosis, squamous cell hyperplasia, and other dermatosis, like psoriasis, seborrheic dermatosis, ulcerative dermatosis. Lichen sclerosis comprises 70% of benign epithelial disorders. Etiology is unknown, and uh, treatment and biopsy is mandatory. Treatment is by MO dense topical steroids, testosterone not effective. Lichen planus types are papillosquamous, hypertrophic, erosive, and uh, this is another example of hypertrophic lichen planus and erosive lichen planus. Treatment is by intravaginal hydrocortisone, subcutaneous steroid creams, vaginal estrogen cream if atrophic is present, vaginal dilators to correct the stenosis, surgery for severe vaginal sinatia, vulvar hygiene, and motion support. This is the vulvar psoriasis, moist lesion without scale, with or without scales. Treatment is by topical cortical steroids, squamous hyperplasia, benign epithelial thickening, and hyperkeratosis. Treatment is by six broad lubricants, medium potency topical steroid. Lacan simplex chronicus, treatment by medium potency steroid. So these were some pre malignant conditions. Some are non neoplastic, but they are overlapping. That is why we have to know the uh, all the disease patterns. Now, I'll discuss one of the vulvar epithelial neoplasia patients. A 35 year old woman presented with persistent itching and discomfort in her vulva, and there was history of HPV infection. Clinical examination revealed the erythematous patches on the vulva. Biopsy confirmed the diagnosis of vulval intrapithelial neoplasia 2. So, based on the NCCN guideline, patient was counseled about treatment options, including surgical excision and topical therapies. And depending upon the patient preference, surgical excision using wide local excision was done. For follow up and surveillance, the patient underwent regular follow up visits every three months for one year and then six months thereafter. Clinical examination and colposcopy were performed at each visit uh, for recurrence or progression assessment. HPV testing was repeated annually. Now I will uh, show, some, uh, show some light on a pre malignant condition of the vagina. It is known as vaginal squamous intrapithelial lesion or VASIL. The 2014 WHO classification for HPV associated precancerous lesions of the vagina, squamous epithelium of the, of the vagina, has replaced a previous three tired vein one to three. LCL is due to transient HPV infection that regresses within one to two years, and HCL of vagina is a result of a transforming type of the virus caused by the high risk HPV 16, 18, and 51. Diagnosis is done by performing immunohistochemistry by P16. The abnormal cells in HCL will be positive for P16, whereas other conditions which mimic HCL will be negative. It is according to my pathology report, high grade squamous intrapithelial lesion of the vagina, uh, published in December 2023. The vaginal intrapithelial neoplasia, here you can see the older classification of VAIM 1, 2, and 3. Here is the cervical condyloma. And VIN is present here. You can see the VIN2 prior to treatment with 5 fluorouracil. Here is a suspicious for invasion. These are all colposcopic features. VIN3 with mosaic vessels and raised orders. 
The signs and symptoms of vaginal precancerous lesion are abnormal vaginal discharge, which may be watery, bloody, or malodorous. There may be postquartal bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding, and she might have pelvic pain or dyspareunia. They are often multifocal. There is no gross lesion. Mucosal irregularities or color changes are there. And in colposcopic examination, acidovitic epithelium, punctation, and mosaicism is seen, as I've shown in my previous slide. The immunohistochemical features are in VAIN1, KI67 positivity in the superficial two thirds of the epithelium, and in VAIN2 and 3, KI67 positivity throughout the entire epithelial thickness. Here you can see the vaginal interepithelial nucleation grade one or low grade has presents with polycytosis and mild ATP and the lower one-third of epithelium in grade two. These are present in two-third of the epithelium and in grade three, it uh, involves a full thickness or, or from two-third to full thickness of the epithelium and polycytosis is also present. Now the differential diagnosis of basal, non-specific squamous hypoplasia, immature squamous metoplasia, reactive inflammatory atypia, atrophy, Transitional cell metaplasia, pseudopolocytosis, radiation atypia, and micropapillomatosis. Now, according to a study of pre-malignant and malignant lesion of the vagina in Diagnostic Histopathology, published in January 2017, mentioned that the vaginal adenosis and uh, endometriosis and the um, clear, cell uh, uh, clear cell adenosis are, were associated with vaginal squamous cell carcinoma. That is why. Vaginal adenosis is a pre-malignant lesion because of its association with vaginal crystal adenocarcinoma. And it is the common site of aden adenosis. It's the anterior aspect of the upper third of the vagina, which is involved in over 85% of cases. We know that diethylstilvestrol uh, is a non-steroidal estrogen, was prescribed to pregnant women to prevent miscarriage and premature birth between 1938 and 1971. It was shown that uh, 90% of women exposed to diethylst silvestrol in utero develop vaginal adenosis. And other studies found that vaginal adenosis in 30% of offspring exposed to diethylst silvestrol, they develop vaginal adenosis. Next is the vaginal endometriosis. Here is the hysteroscopic view of superficial vaginal endometriotic implants and the detailed aspect of the cystic area with retained blood. And below is the colposcopic view of vaginal endometriosis, the burnt matchstick appearance. And here is the whitish and pinkish, like early endometriotic features. The vagina is an uncommon site for endometriosis, accounting for only 2% of biopsy proven cases. And the risk factors include an increased number of menstrual cycles, reduced parity, and a possible genetic basis. Another interesting one is the neovaginas. Like we are, uh, we often encounter women with uh, neovaginas uh, because more people are having sex reassignment surgery. Neoplasia and condylometer have been documented in neovaginas of transsexual women created by the inverted penile skin. Uh, according to the publication in International Journal of STD and AIDS published in 2014, it mentioned that even females with Rokitensky syndrome syndrome present with an absent vagina and a rudimentary uterus, they can also undergo neovaginal uh, construction. So here we can see development of condyloma in the neovagina present in a transsexual woman. So we have to be careful and you know, alert that we might find such uncommon presentation in our daily practice as well. Now coming to the treatment options, we have to follow the National Comprehensive Cancer Network NCCN guideline, which provides evidence-based treatment strategies for observation we, in low-grade lesions, we can follow up and observe and surgical intervention, excisional procedures, removal of the lesion, including wide local excision and valvectomy for VIN or VAIN lesions can be done. Laser therapy, ablation or vaporization may be used for small localized lesion or with patients with extensive disease or those who are not surgical candidates. Now coming to a small case study of VAIN, a 45-year-old woman presented with postquartal bleeding and vaginal discharge. She had history of uh, cervical uh, intrapithelial neoplasia and previous treatment for a HPV infection. Palposcopic examination revealed a raised erythematous lesion on the vaginal wall. Biopsy confirmed the diagnosis of vein 3 and the involvement of the full thickness of vaginal epithelium. So treatment decision according to NCCN guidelines, she was counseled about treatment options for laser therapy, surgical excision, and topical therapies. 
and she chose laser ablation therapy to eradicate the lesion. For follow-up and surveillance, the patient underwent regular follow-up visits every six months for the first two years, then uh, yearly thereafter. Clinical examination and colposcopy were performed at each visit to assess recurrence of the disease or the disease progression. Pap smear and HPV testing were repeated annually to monitor for persistence or recurrence of HPV infection. So for a conclusion and take home message, I would like to say that the management of vulvar and vaginal intrapetinal neoplasia requires a comprehensive approach, encompassing diagnosis treatment and a long-term surveillance. Early detection through screening methods such as pap smear, HPV testing, visual inspection, um, and liberal biopsy should be uh, taken. Healthcare providers can make informed decisions regarding the screening, biopsy, treatment modalities, and follow-up care. An clinical examination, we, we, we can uh, diagnose it, and it is a main cornerstone of surveillance. Colposcopy can give um, magnified uh, visualization and biopsy to confirm the diagnosis and for presence or recurrence of progressive disease. The treatment options based on the NCCN guidelines may include surgical interventions like surgical excision laser therapy or medical management like topical therapies tailored to the individual's uh, need. And the long-term surveillance plays a crucial role in detecting any recurrence and these include regular follow-up visits, clinical examination, colposcopy, and HPV testing. As I've mentioned in the two previous case scenarios of vulvar and vaginal intrapetelian neoplasia. And most importantly, multi multidisciplinary care involving gynecologists, oncologists, pathologists, and other healthcare providers ensures comprehensive management. So by adhering to the evidence-based guidelines and implementing a patient-centered approach, we can reduce the risk of progression to invasive cancer and improve the patient's quality of life. So actually, these are some uh, photographs I took uh, right from the internet that women suffer in silence because they are not aware of their even they are not aware of their anatomy. So they are uh, they take a long time before seeking help in case of vulvar and vaginal intrapetelian neoplasia. They suffer immensely psychosexually, and they encounter themselves in vulnerable situations. They have difficulty in talking. They have fear and misunderstanding. And particularly, I would like to mention that there is lack of knowledge and understanding, both in the woman, both in society, and even in the healthcare system, even amongst us, the gynecologists. So we have to address the speaking, the unspeakable, and it actually concerns the vulvar and vaginal disease, a combination of easier access to patient-focused information about symptoms and treatment, along with greater public awareness and acceptance as a rare yet debilitating disease we should have to make this awareness campaign started. So coming to my first slide, and this is the last slide, I mentioned about Taramon Bibi who suffered due to lack of diagnosis, lack of delay in diagnosis and delayed treatment in the inoperable stage resulting in fistula as a complication of radiotherapy. Now I would like to mention three young ladies Nishita, vulvar cancer survivor, age and diagnosis 40. She says, I'd much rather be embarrassed and alive than modest and dead. Early detection is the key. Jahanara, vaginal cancer survivor, age and diagnosis 38. She said, do not let fear, embarrassment, or shame prevent you from finding the help you need. You are not alone. Yasmin, vulvar cancer survivor, age and diagnosis 28. You know your body better than anyone. If there are any changes, get it checked out. So we have to... Uh, actually encourage our women and our clinicians and our patients to actually at least visualize their vulva with a mirror once in a month when they are doing the self-examination of breast or you know uh, screen of breast cancer, breast lump, they should visualize the vulva as well. So I think it is time that we clinicians um, start this awareness program and we and uh, spread the light of the care about the vulval and vaginal diseases. So thank you very much. These are for my references. And thank you very much. I think I've taken a few minutes for. Thank you. And I'm really honored to be associated with this um, learned uh, faculty and the learned audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fausia. It was an, a wonderful talk. That is that. That topic. And the interesting talk. Thank you. Chat Thank, you, Thank you, Dr. Fauzia, for your clear and 
precise lecture. I'm a colposcopist and I understood so many things from your lectures. And I agree that we are poor in detecting vulvar, vulvar lesions and vaginal lesions. Because many times when we do colposcopy, we, are, we do it in a hurry, especially in Bhutan. So we have the risk of missing these lesions. So thank you for your lecture. And in Bhutan, after we are seeing more vault cancers because of our long screening program, we've done many, we, we do many, many leap, but we do many hysterectomy also. So we we see quite a few vault cancers after vaginal vault cancers after the after you know undiagnosed after hysterectomy for hysterectomy. CIN. So this also has to be kept in mind by by our colleagues, I think. I and mean, this is an information I'm giving because of what's happening in Bhutan. So thank you once again and are anyone is uh, are we allowed to ask questions? I mean, so they can put in the chat box. I think we are. Yes, I mean, if the so audience want time, want yes. to ask questions, yes, sir. let them put it in the chat box, madam, okay. because we are running short of time. We have to finish by right. six. Okay. Thank you, Doctor Fauzia. Thank you, madam. I'm humble at your presence. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chapa, sir. Yes, Sahiti, we can go with the third session, I think. That is the interesting session of the panel. Sahiti, you can put the CV of Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi, already introduced. So I welcome the moderator, Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi. Hey, one minute, wait, Sahiti. Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi, she is the professor and HOD of uh, Department of uh, Dynamic Oncology, Kathak, and member of Oncology Committee, CEFOC and Governing Council Member, ICOG Chairperson, Oncology Committee, FOXI 2018-20, and she is the Johi Peer Reviewer. Welcome, Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi. Bhagya Lakshmi, can I introduce the panelist? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, Sakiti, you can put the CV of our panelist. Then our expert, Dr. Sabira. The Sabira is the Founder Chairman, Department of Gaini Oncology, uh, Bangladesh, I think, no? Yes. Uh, founder, President, Bangladesh Society of Colposcopy and Clinical Pathology, Founder, Chairman, Community Oncology Center Trust, and the Founder, Secretary General of uh, Gynec Oncology Society, Bangladesh, National Coordinator of Residential Training on VIA and uh, Colposcopy, and Editor for the JOGSP. She has authored many books. Welcome, Dr. Sabira. Next, Sahiti, our panelist, Dr. Janatul. Uh, she is the Professor and Gynec Oncology and uh, she is from life member of uh, many associations and uh, gynecological oncology society of bangladesh scientific secretary and ec member of bangladesh society of colposcopy and cervical pathology and member society of oncology task force ogsp and she has many awards to her credit welcome dr janathul next now i welcome dr yapa he is a professor of uh, he is uh, not able to see the words and the things. She is from University of uh, uh, Sri Lanka and she is a, he is the membership of Sri Lanka College of Obstetrics and Gynecologist and Sri Lanka College of Oncology and SLCOG and a certified member of the International Ovarian Tumor Analysis IOTA Group. British Society of Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, the Endometriosis and Adenomyosis Association of Sri Lanka, and he has many research to his credit. Welcome, Dr. Yappa. Then we have Dr. Tahira. She is a fellowship gynecology in AKUH. She has done diploma, basic and intermediate laparoscopy and hysteroscopy, assistant professor and consultant in OG department of Karachi, Pakistan. Welcome, Dr. Tahira. And we have Dr. Sarita, consultant and professor in Badman Mahavir Medical College and the Safdarjang Hospital, Delhi, 
and board member international federation of colposcopy and cervical pathology and organized asia's first ifcpc world congress of colposcopy chairperson of oncology committee aogd and executive member of association of gynecological oncologists uh, of india and uh, she is the past president of indian society of colposcopy and cervical pathology master trainer in mp state government screening programs academic coordinator for a dnb gyne oncology program at sastar jang hospital welcome dr sarita next we have dr inia she is a colposcopy and a preventive cancer treatment doctor and basic ultrasound and a, uh, obstetrics uh, and gynecology ultrasound acls provider she is a consultant in which uh, hospital puttu mole hospital and uh, she is an uh, empaneled consultant in og in treat of hospital and uh, is from maldives she has many publications welcome dr uh, inia dr rajeshwari she is the senior consultant and preventive oncologist col colposcopy specialist and uh, giving lectures and awareness session in uh, cervical and breast cancers and she is working in the global hospital and giving awareness sessions on adolescent health school and college students conducting colposcopy camp welcome dr rajeshwari next is dr jitendra dr jitendra has done his fellowship on gynae oncology from asian medical center korea gynae oncologist in bp koirala memorial cancer hospital and he is the hod of civil service hospital national cancer hospital and nepal cancer uh, cancer hospital kathmandu nepal and professor of og national academy of medical sciences and a uh, member of many organizations oncology committee chair of any sog and oncology committee member ao for vice president gynec oncology society of nepal and general secretary physician for social responsibilities nepal so he has many publications to his credit welcome dr jitendra i think i have it in called all the panelists anyone left bagya i think we have no, invited no. yes we will start no, no. with the panel discussion sahiti can we go with the case discussions i welcome all the panelists and the co moderator and the expert yes moderator being dr bagya lakshmi and dr sampath kumari and we have introduced all the panelists and our expert so as an introduction as all of us know the cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women globally around 6 lakh and 60000 new cases and 3 lakh and 50000 deaths cervical cancer is caused by persistent infection that is of the hpv prophylactic vaccination against hpv screening and treatment of pre cancerous lesion that is our 90 70 90 will prevent the cervical cancer and are very cost effective next the highest rate of cervical cancer incidence and mortality are in low and middle income countries next women living with hiv are six times more likely to develop than women without the hiv now we can go with the cases very simple cases now we had a wonderful uh, talk by dr ramani madam and dr fausia see this is nisasel who is 35 years b2 l2 previous two normal vaginal delivery lcb being 5 years sterilized come to the gynecology opd with a complaints of vaginal discharge how do you proceed further with the screening we will start with dr sarita dr sarita how are you going to screen yeah so dr. thank you so much uh thank you so much uh, madam dr sampath kumari dr bakhi lakshmi and dr sham desa in the suffolk for this invitation uh yes definitely she is in the age group of screening so 25 to 65 years is the age for screening and so the methods we have different methods available for screening uh that is the the pap smear which can be in the form of the conventional pap smear or liquid based cytology whatever is available hpv testing if that is available that is the ideal test uh which should be done recommended by the who co testing is combined hpv plus cytology however the uh, primary hpv testing is the uh, test recommended by the who and it's not combined uh, co testing is not found to be a uh, cost effective yes. and then if facilities of, of either pap or even hpv are not available 
then the uh, simplest test is the VI or visual inspection with acetic acid. And yeah, then you visualize after one minute after applying acetic acid uh, or after applying glucose 17. However, with the with the presence of discharge, I would like to, you know, uh, if, if, if I was taking a, a conventional pap smear, I would wait uh, and or even screening by VI, I would treat the infection first uh, by antibiotics and then once the discharge is cleared then it will be um, easier otherwise you will get a lot of inflammatory smears and the VI you will you will get a lot of false positive results but with the uh, the advantage of the LPC is even if where there is discharge then it, the those inflammatory the the WBCs the cells get filtered off and you can clearly see the squamous cells because it 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 get, you actually centrifuge the sample and then do get a cell pellet. And with HPV testing also, there's an advantage because you can test the virus even when there is discharge. So these are different methods. So whatever uh, is the method available and feasible in your setup, so that method, that method of screening should be adopted. Thank you, Dr. Sarita. Do any one of you want to add anything to this? Yes. Next slide. So the newer modalities, now we are not, uh, yes, we can go with the newer modalities of screening. Already you have told everything. So this is the uh, screening test. What is the molecular test and visual inspection? I think Sarita has covered everything. In our places, again, with the Magna mission, I think Sarita in the primary health centers, they are doing that visual inspection of acetic acid also. That is, yes. uh, if the pep smear, the pathologist is to be needed. No, we are done even in the primary health center. Now yes. you had the wonderful talk by Dr. Ramani Madam that Ramani Madam is giving the training for the paramedicals and uh, the doctors and everything. The paramedicals are given two days or three days training for this via also. Thank yeah, you, Dr. Sanjay. Yeah, a lot yes. of uh, states in India, they have started screening using VI, uh, the government. Uh, and VI is the screening method in the government of India uh, screening program, the government of India guidelines. Uh, so and a lot the the uh, yes the training is happening. So I've been a part of the MP government uh, yes. program. So I've trained a lot of uh, you know uh, doctors as well as the nurses, and uh, it's expanding to the other states. Yes. So for the screening, thank you, Doctor Sarita. Next slide. Yes, I think Doctor Rajeshwari is there. Doctor Rajeshwari, can you explain this uh, PAP classifications? Are you there? Yes, madam. So, yes, madam. Yeah, PASMIR is uh, uh, reported using Bethesda system, which uh, states that within normal limits or abnormal squamous cells, low grade squamous interrupt, yes, LSIL, HSIL, or invasive carcinoma. And according to WHO, it is like mild dysplasia, moderate, severe dysplasia, and carcinoma in situ. Uh, in Richard 2001, it is like saying 1, 2, 3, it's not used. Now we use only Bethesda system. The oldest uh, one is Pepernicola system, which is uh, not used now. We use Bethesda system. Yes. So Thank Bethesda, you. Uh, can I just uh, say that Bethesda? Yes, sorry, yeah, the Bethesda 2014 system is used actually, and the terminology is uh, is different rather than the Bethesda 2001. Let's, so yes. uh, it is uh, yeah, reactive inflammatory and uh, the, uh, is, uh, the epithelial cell abnormalities or glandular cell abnormalities. And then the epithelial cell abnormalities are then categorized as ASCUS or uh, L-cell, HSIL or ASCH. Yes. Then glandular abnormalities are also classified as abno uh, abnormal glandular cells, NOS, or uh, abnormal glandular cells favoring nucleus. Yeah. So that. Thank uh, you, Dr. Sarita, for the information. Next slide. So, this patient, her patient, the PAP was reported as a. Yes, everything she has put. Okay. It was reported as a high grade cell. So, how are you going to proceed? Any one of you, Dr. Yapa? Or who is that? Dr. Janatul, Dr. Tahira, anyone can take up. Yes, Dr. Yes, uh, can you answer this question? This patient was done the pap smear and was reported as high grade sin. It's sin. So, how are you going to proceed with this? Ma'am, I'm Dr. Tahira. Yeah, uh, Ma'am, I'm going to answer this question. Yes, madam. Uh, since this uh, pap smear is reported in high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, we need to go for a definitive diagnosis by colposcopy. 
and uh, uh, we should do the cold postcopy as it is already explained in detail very well document all the finding and once based on the uh, cold postcopic findings if the diagnosis is confirmed then we need to go for colonization and uh, again confirm the diagnosis because as dr ugin said that we are doing a lot of hysterectomies for the benign lesions just because we are not doing the work up in detail so we should do the colonization after confirmation of the diagnosis only then we need to go for the definitive treatment but if there is no uh, invasion noted on the um, colonization or the margins are negative we can even keep this woman on the follow up but if there is some micro invasion or the margins are positive then we only look and based on the regular follow up we can further uh, decide accordingly yes tahira for this patient this colpo was reporting was cin3 See, do you believe that going with the conization, or do you want to go with the lip? Any one of you? We can go with the legs also. Large loop excision of transformation zone also in this case. Doctor Jitendra. Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm from Nepal, and I, I fully agree. Like, uh, I think uh, she should. She is a good candidate for uh, excisional therapy. Uh, which uh, among which lip can be a good alternative if facilities are there and of course uh, conization is another uh, good option but with con conization uh, there is uh, probably issue of uh, more of hemorrhage uh, and uh, sometimes it can be quite uh, messy but again uh, the advantage of uh, conization would be a better specimen pathological specimen and deeper one but uh, if we are uh, concerned about uh, the peripheral margin not endocervical lesion then probably lip and even if there is uh, suspicious uh, of endocervical lesion in colposcopy then lip with top hat uh, would be better and for uh, sometimes in such cases with uh, endocervical ex extended lesions uh, endocervical curators uh, would also be recommended yes 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 uh, madam i just want to add that you know at the i, I would assess at the time of colposcopy how big is the lesion because in in a, if you are going to mapping is important no sarita yes so yes. The mapping and then go with the conization beyond the border. Yes. Yes, because we, we need to go beyond the lesion and with the leads and, and the, you are limited by the size of the cone. And if the lesion is big, you need to go for cone cone knife conization uh, mm -hmm. because the leads will you you may not be able to take the go beyond the margin of the lesion. Suppose the patient cannot come back for any follow up. She is from the water distance places. Would you like to do anything? Any one of you? Well, we'll, we'll need to go and, uh, review the histopath finally. The cold knife, yes. cold knife conization would definitely be better. And uh, also, we need to see the extent of the lesion. If it's going inside the endocervical canal, again, conization is better. As uh, Dr. Because... Rajitendra was telling. Mm -hmm. yes. Pro yes. Conization with frozen section, we can do so that margin we can see and with the stage sitting. If margins yes. are okay, we can. Okay, it is taken. Yes, so, madam. In most of the uh, uh, in most of the countries, like uh, in Pakistan, the the main problem or the issue which we commonly face is that our patients they do not follow up regularly. If yes. we do the let her leap, and if the margins are positive, we advise them conization. Probably the patient will not come to the clinic again. So we should take the advantage if he is uh, presenting to the clinic to do the conization at first instance, make the diagnosis and advise her for the definitive diagnosis. So I'm more towards the cold knife conization in this patient. Yes, yeah, that the failures for this patient definitely the conization and the border was negative. So the take home message is no hysterectomy in this case. That is the take home message I wanted to tell. So always we should go with the procedures whatever and see the pathological report for her colonization is still and the border was also negative and uh, yes thank you next slide by lakshmi 
So this is uh, any one of you, Dr. Uh, Rajeshwari. Can you explain the codization procedure? Are you doing that? Not routinely, madam. Not. Yes, so leap or condensation, whichever is comfortable, that is, we are going to remove the tissues Tissue. with this and then we are going to take for the pathology. So the take-home message is the simple procedures like leap or condensation should be done and hysterectomy should never be counseled for the patient. Okay, thank you. Any one of you wanted to Dr. Sabira, madam? Uh, thank you for asking me about this uh, question. Uh, first thing I want to say that the... Uh, uh, that uh, subsequent management of uh, CIN3, histopathological diagnosis CIN3, we should take decision according to the size of the lesion. Some factors should be considered. First of all is the size of the lesion. If it uh, covers the most, more than 75% of the circumference of the cervix, in that case, colonization can be done. Uh, and other things, then if the lesion is extended into the endocervical canal, then you can do conization. Uh, and if the lesion is glandular, in that case also we, we can do conization. But there are some lesions which are not the candidate for conization. The, as for example, the very small lesion located in the anterior postural leaf of the cervix, which has not extended into the endocervix, uh, in that, uh, in, uh, and not glandular lesion, uh, in these cases, we, we should do first the lip biopsy. In during during the lip biopsy, we should we can also take care whether the, the, that whole of the lesion is coming and the margin is more than, uh, uh, the beyond the margin of the lesion. We should take uh, uh, at least two millimeter by lip to for surgical uh, extra histopathological examination. So small lesion located in the uh, any of the leap of the service um, can be first treated by leap. And if the margin is negative, then leap is the treatment for this patient. And yes. uh, she can be subsequently followed up. But there are some lesions, I, which I have mentioned, uh, may have conization first. Initial uh, procedure may be conization, and subsequently you can take decision whether she needs further treatment. Yes, Dr. If Sabina. it is invasive, then... In principle, then we can do. We should do her radical hysterectomy. And if it is not in principle, uh, in that case, we leave colonization is the treatment. And provided that there is no lymphovascular space in, in, involvement, there is no microinvasion, and the margin is free, uh, colonization is the treatment for this patient. Yes, madam. Thank you. So the leap is the simple procedure, safe and less effective. Conization is alternative. The conization sometimes can have the intraoperative bleeding of 4.2 to 7.9, to 2.6, and postoperative infection 0.3 to 3.5 percent. Damage to adjacent organ 0.06 to 0.5 percent. I think for want of time, we can go with the third case. Next slide. See, this is PHC referred as via positive. The same thing. We are going to do the colposcopy. Next slide. Bhagya, you can discuss the third case. This is more or less like the second case only. Aim of the colposcopy, as already Ramani Madam has discussed. Next slide. So the terminology is normal and abnormal colposcopic findings. These are all everything has been discussed. Next slide. This is the same. And next we had the VD score. What is grade one? This was discussed by Ramani Madam. Fine mosaic pattern punctations and the high grade being the thick border, dense osteoate epithelium. Next slide. Sweet score, Madam has explained clearly. Depending on the score we are going to treat, that is total score of 0 0.04 normal. 5 to 6 is CN2, 7 to 10 is CN3. Next slide. So the same thing. For this patient, pap smear, which were from the primary health center via positive, it has been referred. And colposcopy guided by FC CN2, again leap was there. Now we will go to the third case. Dr. Bhakya Lakshmi, you can take over. Follow. Yes. Follow. Can I just uh, add, uh, <laughs> Madam, the, the, you know the term unsatisfactory colposcopy, we used to say that earlier, but now that unsatisfactory colposcopy has been replaced by adequate and inadequate colposcopy. As okay. Yes, yes. Yes, adequate. So if the surgery... Thank you, Dr. Sarita. Uh, Madam, before we go to the next case, I think we should discuss a bit about the follow-up. Follow. So, yeah. Yes, yes. You go to follow. the previous slide. Previous slide. Go. Yes, yes. Dr. Rajeshwari. 
follow up yeah, please tell us after the cn2 diagnosed with the she, she might be treated with an ablation procedure or bleep so after the next cycle next period i will follow up for the cervix whether it has healed or not and uh, then the next follow up will be after 6 months because the majority of the lesion will be uh, recurrent or persistent lesion will be there and detected within one year so after 6 months i will take a smear yes. uh so and the risk of persistent infection for her will be for nearly 10 years of life and hence uh, for 5 years it will be like 6 month follow up and after that it will be a annual follow up and uh, she should be at a regular follow up uh, willing for a regular follow up that patient and each time accordingly to the reports positive or negative she will be uh, under the triaging yes and i think even if she has a hysterectomy she has to have a follow up for 20 years so that yes, is uh, very important yes even if she has a hysterectomy for cin dr samira do you want to tell anything so uh, thank you very much cin2 uh, histopathologically diagnosed cin2 this is very inconsistent histopathology cin2 cin2 maybe cin1 maybe cin3 so first of all cin2 before going for treatment of cin2 we can do some test uh, you know histopathological test that is p16 and ki67 if ki67 and p16 is positive that patient needs uh, treatment and treatment should be like cn3 and if this immunohistochemistry cast chemistry report that is p16 and ki67 is negative in that case we can uh, we can follow the patient we can consider this case as cin1 and we can follow the patient this is the basic rule of management of cin2 cases and if uh, you treat the patient and then usually if we take decision for treatment of cin2 cases and the treatment should be like cn3 that is ablative uh, sorry excisional procedure but in this case also we can consider the size of the lesion extension of the lesion uh, and other uh, risk factors of the patient sometimes we can do small lesion we can do an ablative treatment but uh, it should be treated uh, like cn3 that is excisional procedure should be done and follow up should be done uh, 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 close follow up should be done for 2 years because persistent and recurrent disease may be occur within chance is very uh, high within 2 uh, years so after that we can follow the patient or uh, yearly for 5 years Five years is sufficient for uh, follow up of this CIN two cases. Yes, madam. I'd like to differ a bit from you that uh, uh, because that KI sixty seven the dual test is not available to most of our people. Available in all centers, but uh, we can if it is available, we can take the uh, decision on the basis so of you this. Have to uh, see uh, your corposcopic uh, image and plan your management. Yes. Okay, yes. madam. Thank yes. you so yes. much. So we Thank go to the doctor. next case. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, Yes, so she is a forty-four year old lady. She is para zero. Comes from a for prolapse symptom, and the routine screening with LBC HPV shows ascus. So I think we have already discussed about what is ascus, and a real time PCR also shows she had a co-testing. So the ask the result was ascus with PCR HPV positive. Next, please go ahead, please. And the genotype was HPV sixteen positive. Next. So I think ascus. Uh, can you uh, brief us a little more about ascus, Doctor uh, Inaya? Are you there? I am Janathul Bhagwaloki. Yeah. Yes, please, please. Okay. Yes. Thank you please, so much. To, please tell you us so something much. about ascus. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you so much to include me. I am from Bangladesh, Janathul Firdos. Actually, ascus is a typical uh, squamous cell of undetermined significance. and abnormal squamous cell in the pap smear test is found cells exhibit an atypical appearance uh, that is the nuclei is enlarged or irregular in uh, um, comparison to the normal nuclei and actually it may also mimic during the any reparative process or reactive process or infections or during metaplasia ascus may be found mm -hmm. Yes, and, uh, I think because uh, it's very important for gynecologists to know all these terms because when you send a report and the report comes back to you with ascus, then you tend to uh, send up for hysterectomy many times without understanding actually what ascus means. Next, yeah. So sometimes this is uh, the report would also come as ascus. Doctor Jitendra, would you like to tell us 
a bit about ASCH? Uh, ASCH, uh, as indicated here, uh, uh, could most probably have high grade lesion. So, yes. so could require definitely. Uh, this is of cytology or biopsy, ma'am? Cytology. This cytology. Uh, you also can see all the cells are lying cytology. separate from each other. So, uh, would uh, require colposcopy and uh, biopsy for yes. confirmation. Thank you, Jitendra. Next, next. I think we should have shared the screen. Next, yeah. So, what we understand this that we cannot rule out high grade lesions from this report. So, there is a. Uh, a uh, great chance that they, she might be harboring some high grade uh, lesion also. So she needs a very stringent uh, treatment protocols. Next. Yeah. So I think this is a study which has shown that if you get a result of ASCUS, the risk of CIN2 is 6.9 and CIN3 is 2.6. And if she's HPV positive, it goes up to 18. If she's HPV negative, it is less. So when you have a core testing, then you have to actually combine both the results and see what is the risk of the patient having uh, harboring higher uh, grade of lesion. Next. Yes, Saiti, are you sleeping? Yes. So I think if she has an ASCUS report and HRHPV is positive, then colposcopy is a must. If the HPV uh, is negative, and even if with a report with ASCUS, you can repeat a pap smear in four to six months. So I think if there's a biggest advantage, I know it's a costly method, but then if you have both the things in hand, it is easy to plan the management further. Next. Next, next. So yeah. So if it is positive, like... Uh, yes, Rasasuri, please go ahead. If it is uh, both positive ASCUS and HPV positive, uh, either in core testing or reflex testing, she should undergo for colposcopy triaging. If uh, yes. colposcopy is negative, she should undergo after a one year uh, follow up. She will come under one year follow up. If it is positive, she will she'll, she'll be uh, with biopsy. If it is positive, she will be for ablation procedures. Uh, if uh, after one year, if it is negative, she will be going for the proper follow up of three years, after three years. So she will be coming under routine screening. So, so the first year follow up is very important if both the thing, colposcopy is negative. Yes, I think in younger patients, many times these changes does happen. But they would regress. Next. Yeah. yeah can I just add? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's really important to have the HPV neg negative. HPV negative HPV test has a very high negative predictive value. So even yes. uh, if the HPV test is negative, we can be just uh, you know reassured that this we there is very low possibility of there being CIN. Mm -hmm. And because you can have ASCUS in when uh, when there is some inflammation, so it's just a minor degree of abnormality in the pap smear. And the degree, if there is HPV positive and an abnormal mm -hmm. pap, pap, so the five-year risk of having C high grade mm -hmm. CIN uh, is actually more than 4%, which is when colposcopy is indicated. So if the HPV is negative uh, and they, uh, but, but the, there is ASCUS, so there's a with the risk is, is less than 4%. So it's actually a minor grade abnormality. And uh, the, the WHO recommends uh, screening only after one year, repeating after one year. The HPV and the part. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sarta. Thank you. Next. So I think now we are going ahead with this ASCCP's risk based approach. It's not like we are looking at one report and managing the patient. So Sarita is actually a member of uh, this group. So please kindly highlight about this uh, risk uh, based approach of management. Yeah, so uh, it's not just one thing that we take uh, into consideration. So it is uh, the pre. It, it's also not just this one report. It if she's had screening earlier, if she's had treatment earlier, if she has an abnormal pap earlier, everything adds to the risk that you assess now, and the addition of the HPV test uh, will again add to the you know what is the risk that we are going to have. So if the HPV positive again, the risk is more HPV positive and an abnormal normal pap smear, the risk is more. So whatever the risks, and this is uh, uh, based on observations of thousands of pap smears uh, they have analyzed over the years. So the and association with HPV. 
so if the hpv positive and the abnormal pap is abnormal and the lowest the least degree of abnormality is the ascus so yeah. the that is 4% so anything more than 4% so the 5 year risk of cim 3 if really? it is 4% or more then colposcopy is indicated yes. so, so what is the risk of cim 3 which is the actually the end point so we have to look at the risk of the woman having a, a cim 3 so that should actually guide us about the management next i think this Yes, I think uh, this uh, question is for Jitendra. What is your opinion for borderline nuclear changes in endocervical cells? Dr. Jitendra, are you there? Yes, yes. Uh, for uh, borderline nuclear changes in endocervical, they they do need more meticulous uh, examination, uh, like during uh, colposcope, uh, colposcopic examination. Uh, probably endo endocervical uh, speculum would uh, would be better, and and uh, they they could harbor uh, uh, pre invasive and malignant diseases. So endocervical curators uh, would also be recommended. Yes, so I think we have to be more careful when we find borderline nuclear changes in the endocervical cells. Okay, so that's the moral of the story. Next slide. The other thing, the the I think the side. If you had, if you if a, you get a report of new changes in endocervical cells, that that means it's a very good report because it is just abnormal. Normally, it's reported as abnormal glandular cells. Mm -hmm. So if it's uh, and if it is if it's not favoring mm -hmm. neoplasia, so it says abnormal glandular cells not favoring neoplasia. So we we really need a good pathologist to say that it is coming from the endocervical cells. So yes, yes. Get I think you have to be very friendly with your pathologist mm -hmm. and uh, actually have a very reliable pathologist. I think that's the um, basis of all the diagnosis and all the further management that we plan. Next. And if we do have abnormal glandular cells, it's not just the endocervix. It could be coming from the endometrium or the fallopian tubes. Also. Yes, yes, yes. So that is again another important thing that we should remember that they are not from the endometrium. Next. So this is the uh, colposcopic finding. Next. Yeah. So it was a large VIA positive area and the thermal ablation was uh, done for this patient. Next. Okay. So is uh, uh, Dr. Inaya, are you there? Okay. So Dr. Janatul, can you take this yes. question? If you... Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, uh, this is uh, uh, the primary HPV screening and cytology triage followed by colposcopy. That means uh, when the HPV DNA testing is positive, then actually we can do we can uh, we can triage the woman either by cytology or by genotyping or by colposcopy or by via. But this uh, slide is showing that the HPV DNA testing when we uh, it is positive uh, and uh, we use cytology as a triage, then the report, if it is negative, then we can repeat HPV test after two years for the general mm -hmm. population of women. But those women who have HIV, we will repeat the test after one year. And if the uh, uh, cytology as a triage, the report gives us ASCUS or even worse or more than ASCUS, then colposcopy should be done. And further management will depend on the colposcopy. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Janathan. So whenever we are doing a triage, it's always the treatment is planned according to the results of the second stage, second test. That is the triage test. So HPV DNA testing is the primary test. And here cytology has been used as a triage. So treatment is planned according to the triage or the second test. Next. So when whenever we do a primary test, Saiti, please go ahead. So whenever we are doing a primary test, we can do any kind of triage so that to rule out any over treatments. So you can, whenever you are doing HPV as a primary testing, you can do a cytology as a triage. You can do HPV genotype as a triage. You can do um, VIA also as a triage. Next, please. And plan accordingly. But mm -hmm. WHO also gives us an option that if you have nothing to triage also, if it's a HPV positive, and you think that the woman may not come back to you again, you can just do a thermal ablation of the entire transformation zone. Next, please. Yes. yes. So, I this is again yet another thing. 
If it is positive, you directly can do a colposcopy also. Next. So the biopsy was uh, fortunately chronic service is only and so follow up was done. So do we have time for one more case or we stop here? No, no, no. Dr. Alia, are you there? Uh, yes. I can, can I have can I have yes. a comment on this case? Yes, madam. Yes, yes madam, please. I should, uh, we think, we think uh, we should stop because we have to pray. Uh, uh, no, can I, I have a comment on this uh, case? Yes, yes, case. please, we will stop uh, yes. after this. Yes. The uh, SCAS, SCAS and HPV positive and 16 and it was uh, negative. Uh, uh, so uh, SCAS then followed by HPV, HPV negative, then follow up after one year and after one year negative then routine screening here i want to say that the uh, if one of the screening test is positive that is ascas positive here then we should not uh, so early enter the patient in the routine screening because routine screening is done at five year interval so five year is very long time uh, so mm -hmm. any of the screening test is positive she should have more frequent uh, evaluation and screening that one if it, one or two is negative then she can enter into the routine screening i think because i, I think so we can take I, one opinion I mean, from one Yappa, negative actually, we missed him. yeah yeah please your opinion on this case yes madam am i audible madam yes 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 uh madam i think like uh, the follow-up uh, the protocols are different from I mean the con country to country in the Sri Lanka and the UK. Basically, like uh, they follow up with the HPV wherever it's available. Now the HPV the follow up is based on basically if it is treated CIN one, two, or three in six months time, having the test of cure. If it's the test of cure, like uh, whether to do at the GP or at the consultant, it depend on whether the margins are involved depend in the histology. If the margins are involved in the histology, which is the CIN 2 or 3, in that case, you do this test of cure, which is done in six months' time by the same consultant and the colposcopy and the, do the colposcopy and same time you do the test of cure. If the HPV is negative, you go to the routine follow-up. And uh, let's say now the CIN one, 2 or 3 treated that your first time and it's a just a focus of uh, CIN and where the margins is not involved, certainly you can have the just the test of cure and if the test of cure is negative you are going back to the normal uh, protocol like usually in uk the follow-up is like uh, till 50 years 49 years it's a three yearly follow-up and after that is five yearly follow-up sri lanka the follow-up is starting at initially it was 35 years to the 45 two cohorts but we uh, the guidelines were renewed and now the follow-up would be starting at 30 years starting at least to cut catch the people from at least five years, but if they request, depending on the risk factors, we could do it. So, uh, but the problem is like uh, most of the countries in South Asian region, the patient compliance and the economic constraints. So mostly in our case in Sri Lanka, what we used to do is like the smear testing, again, quite similar to uh, what the speakers discussed. So that would be the quite similar follow-up, I would say. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Dr. Sampath, I think we can uh, round yeah, up. Now. You can tell the vote of thanks, I think. Okay. That's all. So thank mm -hmm. you so much, uh, Ramani, Madam. It was really wonderful hearing from you, Dr. Fozia, and all our learned panelists. Uh, Dr. Sampath, it was nice uh, of you to organize this. And uh, Dr. Ali, I think, has already left. So thanks to Shyam Desai, sir, for having been here, Dr. Nirja and Dr. Uh, Farana Devan, our secretary. So And thank you, of course, Saiti and Chitrakala for having done all the uh, um, uh, work behind the screen. So thank you very much. Can we have a group photo? Please, everyone could have their uh, videos on, please. Yes. All of you, please open the video. Whoever is there. Yeah. I think Saiti, please take a picture. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Oh, Dr. Alia is there. Okay. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so thank much, Dr. Alia. Thank being you, here. Dr. Alia. Yes, yes, I have Thank you, everybody. It was Thank really wonderful. Thank you, Madam. Thanks for the opportunity, Madam. Thank you, Thank madam. you Dr. Ugen, have for having joined at the very short notice. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.
Bye, 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 bye. Thank you. Thank Thank you. It was an excellent session. Very mind, very brainstorming session. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.